Hi everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today we're talking about AP Macroeconomics, and we're looking at the aggregate demand curve. Here we go. So first off, the aggregate demand curve is a schedule or curve that shows the amounts of real output, real GDP, that buyers collectively desire to purchase at each possible price level. Before we get into that, let's just talk about some of the other things. So, on the y-axis, we have the price level, which is essentially the price index, like CPI and GDP deflator, which means, based on the equation uh, for inflation, if there's an increase of P1 to P2, that would be inflation. P2 minus P1 divided by P1 times 100 equals inflation, and then it can also go down, that would be deflation, or a term called disinflation, which is a, a lower inflation than previous. They'd be like inflation going from a 7% down to like 4% would be disinflation. On the x-axis, we have the real output or real GDP, which is what I typically use. You also might see RDO for real domestic output. And that can identify economic growth. And based off of if there is more stuff being produced, you could predict if unemployment has increased or decreased. So before we even get to the graph, uh, it's an or to the aggregate demand curve important graph because it identifies a lot of the main economic indicators, which is why for macroeconomics, a lot of things come back to this graph. Now for the aggregate demand curve, the actual what does it say? So what is the aggregate demand curve? Well, let's go back to some old equations. Real GDP equals the nominal GDP divided by the price index in hundredths. And this can, of course, be rearranged. The GDP equals the real GDP times the price index in hundredths. And again, we have the price index, P1. We have the real GDP, Q1. So GDP equals Q1 times P1. So that's GDP. So what's aggregate demand? It's the GDP. It's a nominal GDP. It's the GDP at that price level which is going to be really important later on. So let's break this down a little bit more. So why is it downward sloping? We had similar things first semester with the substitution and income effect. This semester for the aggregate demand, which is all the things that are going to be buying things, all the people, households, businesses, etc. Why is it downward sloping? There's three reasons. The real balance effect, the interest rate effect, and the foreign purchase effect. So all these are based off of the price level changing, and therefore the real output will change. First one, let's consider the real dollars, meaning if inflation is high, people, their money doesn't go as far, so they're going to buy less, and if the price level goes down, they can buy more. What's my example? Let's say a country has $100 of national income, so their, their GDP is $100, they can buy $100 worth of goods. So let's assume all prices are $1, CPI is 100 so that th they can buy 100 units. Okay. Well, if inflation doubles and the CPI is now 200 well, now mathematically, they can't buy as many things. They can only buy 50 units. Why? Their GDP, the amount of goods and services purchased in that year, is still $100. But because of the buying power, they can't buy as much. So the nominal GDP has not changed, just the real output has changed. So the higher the price level may reduce the spending on real output and vice versa. So that's the real balance. The balance of your bank account adjusts to inflation. That would be the real portion. Second reason, interest rate effects. I don't like this one as much as far as you use for aggregate demand curve because it starts with, well, let's remember the real balance effect. But it does have its purpose, so let's talk about this. First an example, you have $10,000, and with that $10,000, you can buy 100 items. So if the CPI changes from 100 down to 50, my $10,000 can effectively buy $20,000 of real value. Here's the thing. Households don't actually typically buy that much more when there's a change in the price level. You buy about the same amount of groceries. You travel about the same amount for gas. You buy about the same amount. Which means I'm going to buy about those same 100 items, but now I only need to spend 5000 of my $10,000. So, what am I going to do with the other $5,000? I'm going to put into a bank. The bank is now going to have some more money. 
If banks have more money, they have more to loan out. If you have more of something, you typically decrease the price. So what's that mean? Because the price level decreased, that's the original statement here, people buy more stuff, not so much in the households, but probably more in the investment category. But because the price level decreased, the investment spending would increase. Or let's say instead the inflation went up, because that, that's probably more realistic. Then in order to buy the same amount of goods, you might need to dip into your savings accounts. So people are going to pull money from their savings. Savings we're going to find later is the basic supply of money, and we'll unpack that statement a lot more. So this is a graph later in class called the loanable funds graph. And so we have the supply, that's the amount of money available to be loaned out by banks. If people pull money out of their savings accounts, that supply decreases. So now interest rates increase. So think of the investment demand curve from previous times. If the interest rates increase, people don't invest as much. They don't borrow as much money. So what's the conclusion? If the price level increases, there's going to be a decrease in borrowing, hence a decrease in real output. So again, we're talking about the aggregate demand curve downward sloping. So again, I don't use this one as much because it starts with assuming the real balance effect is a thing. But it definitely highlights the conversation of causation. If this, then that. If interest rates change, that affects investment spending, and that is something we will definitely spend more time on later. Last one is the foreign purchase effect. So I kind of go back to the substitution effect from first semester supply and demand. You know, we had Pepsi and Coke, and if the price of Pepsi went from $1 to $2, the quantity demanded for Pepsi decreased, and the quantity demanded for Coca-Cola increased. Okay. The foreign purchase effect is, well, instead of Pepsi and Coke, we have country A and country B. Because Pepsi and Coke, hey, if you're buying them at Safeway, that's all the same GDP. So what are you substituting? Alternative countries goods. So if I'm country A and my prices have doubled, then I'm going to stop buying from my domestic markets and I'm going to start buying more from country B. So there's a decrease in the demand, decrease in real output from my domestic country as I'm going to go somewhere else. So again, because of change in price level, the real output for my domestic country has changed from 50 to 25, just simple numbers there. So that's the foreign purchase effect. So change in price of different countries, price level will change the amount of goods export and imported from the domestic country. In this case, we'd be talking about country A because the foreign purchase effect is talking about the country that changed prices or price level in this case. Next, we're going to go into the determinants, meaning if the price level stayed the same, what would change the aggregate demand curve, a.k.a., you can see in green here, what would change the GDP? And the nice part is, we've already talked about this, it's the expenditure approach, C plus I plus G plus net export. So if any one of those categories changes, then the nominal GDP has changed. And again, nominal GDP equals aggregate demand. So consumer spending. What would change consumers from spending? We talked about this when we talked about the consumption curve. There's the wealth effect. If your wealth increases, like stock market prices increase, you're going to spend more because you feel wealthier. Consumer expectation. If I think my job is in peril, I think we're going towards a downturn, I'm going to not spend as much because of future expectations. If in general, the households of our generation are more okay with debt, I will spend more compared to previous years. Personal taxes. If the taxes change, the taxes increase, that means my disposable income, that'd be personal income minus taxes, my disposable income would decrease with taxes increasing. So I don't have as much money to spend. And if taxes decreased, I would have more money to spend. So we're going to be going through more of this, what would impact consumption, what would make people change this a lot more throughout the semester. Second group, investment. Gross private domestic investment. Well, here we refer back to the investment demand curve. So we have the real interest rate. If interest rates change, again, we're going to talk about the banking sector and the centralized bank and, and their monetary policies later in the semester. If those change, well, then that changes people's desire to borrow money or ability to borrow money. Expected returns. If I think the future legal conditions are going to be changed, it's going to be easier, it's going to be harder because of the legislation, 
I might change what I'm going to do now. If there's improved technology for me to invest in, gives me a higher return on my investments, I'm going to do that. If there is no excess capacity in the economy, I'm more inclined to buy new capital because I need to produce more. If there's an abundance of excess capacity, I don't need to invest in new capital because there's already places to grow. And business taxes similar to the first person income taxes. Then we get to government spending. The government changes their spending, honestly, not that often. It, it's a the government has a big budget. Every country has a pretty big governmental budget, but it doesn't actually change that much. It might change where the money gets allocated, but that's a different question. So when is there a change to the government spending? This is where things like stimulus packages. Okay, we saw this in the COVID, uh, the United States is COVID nineteen stimulus, like one point six trillion dollars. That was an increase to the spending. If there's a natural disaster, that's emergency spending money kicks in. Okay, if it's forest fires, hurricanes, floods, whatever else. Okay, that's an emergency service kicking in. Foreign aid could kick in. That would be a change to government spending. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about fiscal policies. And then net exports. That's going to be for right now the value of the exports minus the value of the imports. If there's a change to that, then that's going to increase or decrease accordingly. You're just adding these numbers up. And especially these last two, we're going to talk more about later in the class. So we're not going to go too much in depth with this. Last little bit is we don't want to forget some of the previous conversations before we talk about the multiplier, multiplier effect that produces a greater ultimate change in the aggregate demands compared to the initial uh, initiation change in spending. So if you have an MPC of 0.75, multiplier 4, if you're not sure how you got that, go back to previous uh, lectures. So there's an initial change of this amount. Based on the multiplier, it would actually shift over four times the amount. That's the idea. Now, again, this is a conceptual thing. You won't actually draw it this way, but this should be something that we remember. An initial change still has a multiplier effect, and we're going to go more into this in later conversations as well. So that was it for today, talking about the egg demand curve. We want to make sure we understand the importance of the different axes. It can shift around based on the expenditure approach. And it is downward sloping because of the real balance effect, the interest rate effect, and the foreign purchase effect. All right. Until next time, bye. Next time, aggregate supply.